Welcome everyone to this brand new interview with Morgan Downey. And Morgan Downey, he is the author of Oral 101, the most comprehensive book about oral I have found so far. He's also the owner and CEO of Money.net. And most importantly, at least in this situation, he is also a very, very nice guy. And from one ex-commodity trader to another, it's really, really hard to find really nice guys in commodities trading. So awesome, awesome that you're on the show here with us, Morgan. Thanks so much, Steve. Happy to be here. <laughs> and um, one thing I actually uh, actually forgot to mention is that Money.net, that is a market information platform. So before we even start talking about oil, which is really your forte, could you just briefly tell us about this new initiative that you are you're doing right sure. now? Sure. Um, so um, most investors will be familiar with products called Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters, and these are um, what are called market information platforms. And it, it, the gist is they're pieces of software that allow you to get market information, to be prices or economic fundamentals or corporate fundamentals. Um, and so traditionally, those systems have cost twenty-five thousand dollars a year, um, and there hasn't been any competition in that space. Uh, in almost over 20 years. So $25,000 a year for one piece of software is very expensive for one user. Um, and so uh, our goal here at money.net is that we offer a better product than Bloomberg or Thomson Reuters, but for only $1,000 a year. So still, it's not, uh, you know, uh, you still are paying for it, but it's, you get all of the data and you can use it through Excel or, or on mobile or on your desktop. And so basically, we're trying to disrupt the, the market for market information. Yeah, wow, great uh, great presentation. And actually, we didn't plan to do this. I was just so surprised when I was calling you up and I was asking, uh, so where is Sin working? Because the last time um, the person I was interviewing on the Investors Podcast, you were sitting somewhere else. And you're yeah. saying, oh, by the way, I have this company. It's in somewhere in Manhattan, 15 yeah. employees. And I was like, you must. 15, 15, 15 yeah. yeah you, 55. You, <laughs> wow, you are the most modest, again, commodities trader I know. Like, you didn't even mention that the first time we spoke together, even on the email correspondence we have. So that's, I think that that really uh, talks really uh, well of you as a as a person, Morgan. Um, the first question I have, and this is about oil, and I know this is a very broad question, but I think that we both agree that the oil price is definitely not at the long run equilibrium right now. It's definitely not lower. So if I'm an investor, how should I play that? How can I invest in a given instrument and then profit from um, an anticipated increase in the oil price. Sure. Um, and so one of the key parts of answering this question is where is the long-term uh, price of oil? Where is the kind of <laughs> yeah. long-term break-even? And a good way to actually, the market is actually tells you that if you look at crude oil futures, and so if you look at either WTI crude, which is quoted on the CME, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or Brent crude, which is quoted on the ICE or Intercontinental, Intercontinental Exchange, the long-term price of crude, if, and when I say long-term, you go out to 2025, so you can buy and sell oil out that far, and the long-term price is around 60 dollars $65 at the moment, as in that's the price the market is saying, you can buy and sell oil for in 2025, so 10 years from now, or 2026, at $65 a barrel. And so that's the kind of the market saying that's the marginal price needed for incremental supply to be produced uh, in 2025, as well as that consumers can tolerate in 2025. And so obviously today we're at four, the low 40s, $43 per barrel mm -hmm. for WTI. Um, how you know how do you buy here at 43 in anticipation of it's getting to you know, uh, a 50% increase and hopefully before 2025? Um, and the easiest way to play this is not through futures contracts because futures contracts are there's a whole bunch of issues with them dealing with them as an individual investor um, because uh, you've got to roll they expire and you've got to manage them they're, they require active management as well as they're very highly leveraged so yeah that, so you know, can I just start with there uh, Morgan yeah. because um, I got this question uh, quite a few times from the forum where we've been discussing your book and we've been discussing oil and there seems to be this concept called roll costs. And that yep. was the one you were talking about before. Sure. Could you please explain that to us? Sure, yeah. So um, so the futures market is a market where you can buy oil um, or sell oil at 
each month out into the future. So for you can buy oil for December of 2016, December of 2017, and each individual month as you go out along the curve. Um, the, uh, when you do that, you're buying a contract via an exchange, either ICE or, not, or CME, one of those two exchanges that are the big two for oil, ICE or CME. Um, as these, as supposing you buy today, today the, the front month is um, is the uh, uh, November contract. Um, when the November contract, because we're, we're moving through time, these futures contracts, we, we're going to pass November eventually, and that November contract will expire and become a deliverable futures contract. And then you can actually go and collect your physical oil. Um, and so each month, a new contract expires, and you have to, as an investor sell that contract or buy that contract before it expires. Otherwise, you actually are going to have to take physical delivery of oil in Cushing, Oklahoma, or in the case of WTI, or the North Sea in the case of Brent. So you cannot hold that contract past its expiry date. You have to roll it forward to the next one. So you have to, if you own the November contract, you have to sell that November and buy December, and do that every single month. Or you can, you can sell November and buy a contract way out along the curve. Um, but. Uh, Every time you do that, that, you're paying brokerage commission to your, your futures mm -hmm. broker. Um, you're also paying the bid ask spread. You know, every contract has got it, just like uh, equities. You're crossing that bid ask spread. You're paying away that bid ask spread to the market. Um, and also, um, you're uh, you're moving along the curve, and that you're actually selling 43 and buying 44. You know, your your basis, if you kind of think of it in equities terms, is changing every time you roll your contract forward. You're because you're buying a different instrument for a different month. You're going from November to December to January, rolling these contracts. And all of that slippage adds up really quickly in, in commodities. Yeah. Um, so, so there are some ETFs that, that use this kind of rolling methodology as their underpinning. The most famous one is USO. Yeah, and, and, and it's really interesting about USO because you also mentioned that in the last interview. Yeah. That is more to track the, the daily movements because that is rolling over every month. Yes. So you're not yeah. profiting from from the long run. Uh, yeah, program. yeah. So yeah. So basically, the futures contract. It's a. I, I would almost equate it as being if you're a hardcore oil trader, then you're trying to hedge BP's revenue or Shell or mm -hmm. or one of these companies' revenues, or you're an airline that needs to lock in its its uh, jet fuel costs. You would use that to do that. Use futures. But if you're an investor, it's a very inexpensive. Sorry, very expensive an inefficient way to, to play oil. The much more easy and efficient way to play oil is via equities. And obviously equities are not as, as you know famous as, as, as they should be either because if you deal with, uh, if you're buying shares of Exxon, what happens if they have a, an oil spill or management mm -hmm. kind of goes nuts there um, and buy, starts buying all these in companies very inefficiently. So you kind of are, when you're buying individual equities, you're, you've also got issues with that. So one of the better ways would be perhaps to buy a, uh, an ETF that tracks a bunch of oil producers, and that will be the most efficient. You're removing kind of the pin risk of one equity going nuts in a bad way or a good way. Um, you, you basically buy either buy a group of uh, EMP companies in the oil space, or buy like the Exxon's and Shells of the world, or you buy an ETF, even simpler, that tracks all those for you, and there you remove all that inefficiency and active management required of futures contracts, and you get, hopefully those companies will all balance each other out in terms of, um, if there's one company has a disastrous management decision, another company will have a disastrously good management decision, so it'll all come out of the market. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's better, to, it, as an investor, it's trading in futures is a always not a, it's a very inefficient may, way of playing oil. Yes, and, and I think you really uh, hit on a great point here because futures that have to expire, it's not like equities as you're saying. And yeah. Of course you can have futures that yeah. expire in like a month, yeah. two years, 20 yeah. years, but you yeah. just think, yeah. I think that expires, even options, you know, you get options and equities and options and futures, options expire as well. Anytime you get into those kind of second derivative type things where you're not buying the core underlying asset, you're buying something that's linked to the core underlying asset and that has an expiry date and all those kind of things, you're adding a layer of complexity that A, you don't need as an investor because you can actually still get a, a, you know, the full exposure to the oil market without that time exposure you know, where you have to actually go in there and actively manage your investment. You want to 
have as passive a management as possible because it's much more efficient. You know, there was a famous study a few years ago of the most successful uh, equity brokerage accounts. Um, I can't remember the name of the brokerage, it was Ameritrade of one of these guys, and they looked at all their brokerage accounts and said, what is the behavior of the most successful equity brokerage accounts? And they found that the most successful yeah. brokerage accounts were those that people had forgotten they had, because yeah. they, they, they didn't actively go in and match it, they would have just held Apple the whole way up. You know, they would have never have taken profit or anything like that. And so passive uh, management, um, where you basically, you, you, I call it set and forget, you invest and you go away, that's almost a very, tends to be a very successful strategy. It is. And it, and yeah. yeah, sorry, uh, Marvin, but I, I remember because I read the same, uh, I read the same article, and it actually turns out that for some of the very, very most successful accounts, they were actually, uh, they were belonging to people that died. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so I know this seems like a weird story, but that's truly passive investing in this yes. Yes. <laughs> situation. Yes. Okay, so you, you're actually saying that uh, if I was thinking that the long long equilibrium was like 60 or 80 or whatnot, I should buy an ETF with equities. That is the most pure exposure I can get um, if, if I don't want to pay too much cost and, and, and have the same upfront payment as I do, would do with futures. Yeah, I mean, yeah, futures is, is um, it's not really, it, it just has a, a lot of, it has a lot of benefits and advantages um, because it's, um, you know, you've got the leverage aspect and whatnot, but for a longer term, especially, you know, when you're investing for more than, you know, longer term, it could be a month or longer type thing, and you kind of want to do, invest in something where uh, you, can, you don't have to go in and, and have to do something every month or have to do something every six months. Um, and it's also, equities are relatively efficient. You can structure your investment to be much more efficient. So futures have an advantage for kind of a hardcore industrial user where they are, part of their job is to go in and actively manage. If you're an airline hedging their jet fuel, your, your, your job is to actually go there and roll the futures and you can- Yeah, of course, it. yeah. Um, and also you need, as you consume more jet fuel or less, or if you're an oil company, you produce more or less, you can kind of modify your futures exposure. Uh, for hedging, uh, but if you're an investor, you, you don't you can do it much more efficiently just using equities. Could you uh, could you recommend a a ticker for an ETF? I'm not thinking so much about comparing the intrinsic value to the price or anything, but just something that we could keep under observation. If if we agree with your approach, saying um, ETF of equities in in oil. Sure. Um, gosh, so I, I don't generally t give recommendations for single stocks or single ETFs. Um, but you know, there's. Uh, I, I can maybe email you a, a list of, of, of like five or six after uh, the call and sure. you know, to, to do that. But generally, I don't give um, single stock or single ETF buyer sell recommendations. No, uh, and and I love that you're saying that because I don't either. I, I get a ton of questions too, and it's it's sort of it's sort of like a game you can win, right? Yeah. If if yeah. if you are right, which you are sometimes, it's kind of like yeah, Morgan is a nice guy, and if you're wrong, it's just your fault that they lost all the money. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's bad business. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk about two different uh, stocks here. Um, the first one is Warren Buffett's latest purchase. I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with his latest purchase in Phillips uh, 66. Um, could you could you tell us about that stock and what you might think is Warren Buffett's reason to go into that stock? Sure. Um, so um, Warren Buffett is is a, a guy that has got a very long term horizon. So he, he, in terms of his horizon is four or five years type thing, and not six months. I guess he, he obviously looks to transact on a timely basis, but uh, his his holding period is very long, and so. Remember a few years ago, he got into the uh, rail industry in the U.S. and North America, just as fracking was expanding because that was a kind of a longer-term play. Uh, there was there was a shortage of pipelines in the U.S., and so all this crude oil had to be shipped on rail. And so the rail industry in the U.S. Had a, has had a huge boom in the last four or five years. And so Warren Buffett, that's kind of he's, he looks at an underlying trend that is uh, that is. Uh, has got a legs that has will last for three, four, five years or longer, um, and he tries to uh, pick that, get a, 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 an investment on that trend as early as possible. So uh, the Phillips 66, um, basically, you've got a, a situation where uh, over the past uh, number of years, there's been 
um, a change in the uh, the refining industry in the U in the U.S. as, as well as around the world. Um, but there's been a shortage of certain types of refineries and a lot of of others. And so he's basically making a play that, uh, given crude oil production in the U.S. at the moment, and it's become uh, I hate to get more technical and um, it's become it's become a lighter, sweeter crude yeah. that's been produced, and that just means you can produce a lot more things like gasoline from the crude oil and less things that are less valuable, like there's a thing called residual fuel oil, and so it's heavy stuff and bitumen used for roads, and so the, so the quality of crude oil um, being produced in the US has kind of moved, changed dramatically in the last four or five years because of fracking primarily. Um, and that all, certain refineries are, have, were fortunate, they didn't really plan for it, but they were fortunate to have been, uh, have built refineries that can, that can deal with that kind of oil. And so he's betting on that fracking play to continue. Ultimately, it goes, back, it goes back to invested in rail initially to take advantage of the fracking industry change. This is kind of a continuation of that bet on US fracking. So he's kind of betting on the fracking industry in the US continuing and it obviously relies on rail for shipping the crude, but it also relies on uh, particular types of oil refinery that can handle this lightly, this light crude that fracking tends to produce. Yeah, so and it's kind of a long-term bet on on the continuation of U.S. fracking. Yeah, and and let's uh, let's keep talking about U.S. fracking because I remember that from a previous interview that you talked about U.S. fracking and the marginal cost that was required for American producers to keep. Um, extracting that oil. Um, could you remind us, what is the marginal cost for, for the fracking sure. to continue? Sure. Um, and so marginal costs are one of those things that, in you know, the way people say, there's a, uh, on a, my background is a trading floor, there's always this concept of mean reversion, you know, where things move around and they revert back to the mean. And I always tell when I you know, rose the ranks on trading floors as a junior trader to a senior trader to having to manage a whole bunch of the traders. And if a trader said to me, oh, where's the, uh, the marginal cost of this? or the long-term marginal cost or the mean reversion cost of this, I would always say be careful because uh, the mean reversion trades uh, always work until the mean moves. So and certain things, structural changes can move. And so to tie that back to fracking, fracking, there's a marginal cost of fracking right now. And so there's a kind of a curve of a kind of a cost curve for all these frackers. You get some frackers cost $85 a barrel, but then you get very efficient guys that are happy to be in what are called the sweet spots. Um, where they can get their costs down to $55 a barrel. Mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of uh, different producers uh, with different cost curves. Uh, so they, some are, some frackers are out of business already because they're, we're sub $85. And some oil fields are, are uneconomical because we're sub $85. But then as you go down lower and lower in price, more of, more of these frackers become uneconomical. And so on average, fracking, it ranges between 65 and 75. That's kind of the big spot where most fracking becomes economical or uneconomical, so 65 to 75 dollars a barrel. Um, but, but then you will have some guys that can be more efficient, they can even produce down here at 45 dollars a barrel, uh, but very much fewer of them. But the big sweet spot is 65 to 75. Um, but the interesting thing is that fracking has become a lot more efficient because the market's forcing it because we're at 45 dollars a barrel. And so that sweet spot of 65 to 75 is now moving down to 60 to 70, and maybe in a year from now would be 55 to 65. And what's happening is that um, when you're fracking an oil well, you've got to hire these what's called a frack crew. And these guys come along and they pump water down and they frack the, the reservoir. And also you've got to drill a huge number of wells. And the, the, the amount of wells is, is such that people actually put the, now the drilling rig onto a big sled and pull the sled along to the next drilling location, that used to never happen five, six years ago. And basically, it's how can you minimize, you don't have to take the rig down and reassemble it, you want to keep it all assembled and just roll it along to the next place. And so all these efficiencies are starting to happen in fracking. They're not happening at a rapid pace because this is a big, uh, uh, expensive industry where there are certain things move a little bit more, move slowly. But fracking 65 to 75 is kind of the marginal sweet spot. and that is moving down over time slowly, just because the market is forcing these frackers to become more efficient. Um, and also a lot of these frackers are, are highly leveraged. They've yeah. borrowed a huge amount of money. And so uh, there's 
uh, you know, that, that adds to their capital structure. So it's not just the cost of physically fracking, there's also the, the fact that these guys have got um, a lot of debt that is coming due uh, right now and over the next year. And a lot of that will, you know, the inability to pay that or the breach of all their loan confidence of a lot of these companies will take a lot of supply out of the market. So it's 65 to 75 is the physical cost. Um, and then you've got also the the high cost of borrowing of all these companies. Yeah, I think it's really interesting you're talking about leverage because in my opinion, leverage uh, in the oil industry might be a catalyst. It might be a catalyst to something big. But the question is, what is the catalyst to? And so what would you, your take be on, yeah, be on sure. that? So, so I think uh, if you look at actually this Q4 2015 and Q1 2016, um, this is when the financing of all these oil and gas companies that have been in the fracking business is really starting to, uh, to come to the fore in that people have talked about, you know, a lot of these companies say, it, only, it was only a year ago that oil was $100 a barrel. So a lot of these companies, like every company, my company here, money we carry a cash balance such that if, if we need it, we can dive into our cash balance to cover any shortfalls. So and you, you hope that you only have to do that over short periods of time. So for a year, since a year ago when oil was 100, a lot of these fracking companies, A, they didn't believe oil was going to fall below 50. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, they would have continued to operate as if nothing had changed. Now they've obviously realized we've kind of gotten into this uh, long, low price cycle. Um, and so a lot of them have eaten into their cash as much as they could. Now they're saying, basically, they're, they're, they're people that they borrowed from are saying, well, we're not going to lend you any more money. And then the other side of it is they burn through a year's worth of cash as we, as we fall in price. And so there's kind of a, a lag in the reaction of all these companies because of their cash balance that they had in their books in their reaction. And now that that, react, that lag is now starting to impact now. So it's kind of a, a shock wave that is only now going to start hitting all these companies. And you'll have a lot of these companies breach their debt covenants. Um, and these will be bad press releases that will come out because you'll sure. see these are big brand name companies, um, and that you know it's it's uh, it could open them up to be you know bought via you know from a, a more stronger you know one of the majors could buy one of the minor companies, and so uh, but that financing is coming to roost right now in terms of its impact on, on these yeah. companies. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting to think about what will happen. Is it? What well, you're saying that a lot of these companies they can default. Of course, they can also be bought up. But does it mean that we have less supply and therefore um, it will push up the price? Is that how you're seeing it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. The, 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 uh, I mean, that was one of the stated uh, complaints, if you will, of Saudi Arabia when they started this kind of price war with all these North American frackers was that they were, uh, you know, all this fracking was was financed on the back of cheap debt. It was, you know, you can borrow as a corporation relatively inexpensively, uh, or ha you could borrow relatively expensively. Um, and so the Saudis were kind of complaining the fact that this, this, uh, all this cheap debt fomented or created this huge source of supply in North America, but that uh, that cheap debt is not sustainable, and therefore that North American fracking supply is unsustainable. And so, and it's true, the, all these companies, you look at the leverage of some of these frackers, it's huge. and, and uh, and it did enable very risky uh, type ventures. It was still all good, you know, in that, you know, that's the nature of markets. Sometimes it, it's good to take a lot of risk. Yeah, um, so, so Morgan, uh, do, you mean, do you think that Warren Buffett, he's buying into uh, really a bet on U.S. fracking? Do you think that the problem we're seeing right now, they are short term because they are high leverage and it will be a good investment in the long run? Or do you think there's a high risk? Exactly. Yeah. No, this exactly. That's why Warren Buffett he's buying a play on fracking where oil is at forty-four dollars a barrel. He's not buying it when it was eighty-five or a hundred. He's buying it now, and so this is a true Buffettism in that he's going in and what you know, forty, forty-four dollars a year from now. He's obviously not expecting oil to be forty-four dollars. He's expecting it to be higher, fifty, seventy, a hundred, and so this is the classic Warren Buffett. You sit there, keep your powder dry. And these are the kind of, it's kind of like when uh, Warren Buffett invested in Goldman Sachs during the financial crisis. Mm. He's the guy that sits there and waits and waits and waits. And when they, you know, when you get to an extreme move, that's when he steps in and, and kind of puts his investment. And he's investing such that, you know, his investment 
he's not going to panic when oil or if oil goes 35 or 25 even. I don't think it's going to go there, but he's not going to panic. He maybe even buy a little bit more. Um, and so that's a classic populism, as in he's he's obviously looks at the long term market and goes, it can't, it's not sustainable at these levels. And is he willing to tolerate a bit of pain down to 35? Yes, sure. But he's tolerating $10 of downside to make maybe a 60 or $80 on the upside. That's a great, you know, great trade. Great. So uh, for one thing, we talked about uh, Warren Buffett's bet on U.S. fracking. Another thing that I'd like to run by you is the play on oil rigs. A uh, very um, popular company here on a forum that is National Oil Vago, which is huge on oil rigs. So without having to talk too much specifically about that company, if, if you, know, you don't want to, um, clearly understandable, but how do you look at oil rigs as a bet, uh, giving a low oil prices? Is that good long-term bet? Is it risky? Is it leveraged? What do you think? Um, so the oil rig business, you got two parts to it. Well, uh, well there's a few, but really two core parts. You got the dry onshore rig business, which is these guys that do all the fracking, but also just non-fracking drilling, and there's a lot of this horizontal drilling. Um, and so there's the dry onshore business and then the offshore business. Off, and in offshore, you've got the shallow water guys, the, the jack-up barges that stand on the ground in the water, and then you've got the deep offshore, shore, the, uh, the uh, trans-oceans of the world, that, that company now based out of Switzerland. Um, and so uh, in the onshore business, um, it's a very... Uh, I, I guess it's a very cyclical uh, and predictable somewhat business in that uh, on the supply side and that just like oil there's a supply and demand of oil there's also a supply and demand of rigs and so right now rig utilization as, as you can see from there's a Baker Hughes number that comes out at one o'clock uh, New York time every every Friday rig utilization uh, in the US has collapsed and uh, so that's the number of active rigs. So where do all these rigs that are not being used go? They're just they're just put to the side and, and put on co in kind of cold storage and, and put into uh, basically waiting for the market for drilling to come back. And so you've got all this excess supply of onshore oil rigs right now in North America. Um, and uh, so it's the rig market has been kind of decimated because because of this. Um, the offshore market is a kind of a different market because that's more of a um, much, it's, it's almost like a space industry, some of the technology that's involved, very ex ex extremely expensive equipment where you got to pay you know, half a million to even a million dollars per day to rent one of these rigs, it's per day imagine. Wow. Um, whereas the on onshore is much uh, less expensive. And so um, basically we've, we've had a, a uh, there's too, much, too many rigs out there um, and the rig market, if you look at it, and I've done this historical analysis on rigs over time, um, it's a, it's much more slow to react to changes in oil prices than oil prices themselves, because it's kind of like a rubber band in that rigs, you know, if we go back up to $100, you're going to have a huge lot of all these rigs back onto the market again, and it's going to take a lot longer for uh, uh, the rig market to react to oil prices on a rally, just because it's it's a more... It's a much more slow-moving, uh, it's a, dr a second derivative of the oil market in that it's more slow, but it's a more slowly moving second derivative. Um, and it's also much more extreme moving in that if oil goes up by 50%, the rig market eventually will tend to go up by 80% or 60%. So it's much more, but then the same on the downside, when oil drops by 50%, the rig market, and when I say the rig market, there's a price, you can call someone up and buy a uh, lease a rig. Very few oil companies own their own drilling equipment. Mm -hmm. They all lease everything, uh, just like the very few oil companies own their own ships. They lease everything. And so um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you can call up a, a rig operator like National Oil Well and say, I'd like to, I've got this job I need to do. Uh, I need a rig on this site or a number of rigs on these sites. Uh, can you quote me a price? And you get a competitive bid for that. And so there's a, uh, Fairly liquid market for oil rigs, yeah. and it's it's um, it, it's it's uh, it's in uh, a bit of a lot of pain right now. Yeah. So Morgan, I can't help thinking what you said that it's really like you're saying if oil drops, it will be um, severely like it would really hit the share price. It really hit the hit the company bad, perhaps even more than it was supposed to do because it's reacting slower. 
Yeah, so, yeah, because it, it basically it's much harder for um, uh, a lot of these these uh, rig operators. Uh, like say you've got the, the frackers, they've got a certain amount of cash in their balance sheet, and they can withstand low prices for a period of time before they shut down uh, drilling and production. Um, these rig operators, uh, any business where they've got, like they basically are sitting there with this fixed cost investment, yeah. all these built uh, uh, built rigs, um, and uh, if they turn off that rig, they don't need it, they don't just burn the rig and, and bury it. They should just park it over there on the side ready to be brought back online at a moment's notice. And so you've got this huge oversupply in the market and other parts of the oil market react like this also. There's the shipping, the tanker market where, you know, if tanker prices have, people don't just sink the tanker and say, okay, we're out of this and the price recovers. People park that tanker and, and use it as storage or just yeah. keep their, it's anytime we get big fixed asset uh, components to a business, that it slows down the reaction of that business to low prices and to high prices. So, um, so, so a moment, does that mean that uh, since you're really suppressing, for instance, rates, that it's now a good time to do that because it's really like the, the prices would be really suppressed for all rate companies, or does it mean that because we have so much supply, you should not be invested in them because it will simply take uh, too long, even though if all price increased to like $80 or something tomorrow, it simply take too long for the business to revert. Well, yeah, the way I would look at it would be once oil prices start to recover, these rig price, rig rates will, will lag that recovery, and so you'll get enough kind of heads up notice that you can kind of buy those stocks cheaper or, or invest in that industry less expensively because oil prices will go up by 30%. The rig market will lag that rally by six months, nine months, because it'll have to clear through that glut of, of all these rigs coming back online. And so uh, there's, it's basically a, a situation where you can get a, you'll get a, the oil market will give you a heads up three to six months ahead of time of when to get into the, the rig market. And so it's basically a, it's actually just a, you know, kind of a, a trading idea or trading strategy to say, uh, once oil prices start to recover, then Three to six months later, that's when maybe you start looking at investing in in uh, uh, rigs or rig own, rig owning companies, rig owning or operating companies, or even tanker owning or operating companies. And you you'll tend to get that long lead time of heads up. You don't have to react today. You can actually wait to see are is oil sticking really up at around seventy five or eighty five dollars a barrel, and you'll get a, a decent kind of uh, timeline between that, that oil price reaction and the market for rigs recovering. Okay. Wow, that's uh, that's really interesting. I'm 100% sure that's something our audience and our community would really uh, really appreciate. Um, let's talk about the uh, the oil price. Right now, we're looking at stocks, and Preston and I we're thinking that's probably overvalued. So I kind of have like two questions. One, the first one is that if you see a huge drop, a crash in the in the equities markets, what will happen to the oil price? And then the other question, I don't know if you can mix those two, but if you see a severe problem in the general economy, it's not just an equities market, but really like a crash in the economy, how would that affect the, the oil prices in, in your opinion? Sure. So in relation to the first one, I thought we've already seen the crash. Hasn't China uh, <laughs> collapsed? <laughs> oh, we're not <laughs> over yet. <laughs> at least the equity market. Um, and so, um, but I, I hear you say in terms of like the U.S. equity market and, and other uh, equity markets, they're still uh, pretty strong. Um, you, usually, um, oil markets and equity markets tend to be tend to have been historically relatively uncorrelated, uh, which is good for investors building a portfolio because you always want to have uncorrelated returns. You always want the po very positive returns, but you also want when one is down, something else compensates for it, such that they all move up in. Uh, uh, you get a more stable result of your portfolio. So traditionally, um, market has been uh, equity has been uncorrelated with oil prices, um, and so uh, there's that kind of. And the reason for that has been that the oil market demand for oil um, is very uh, is, is very stable. It grows stably every year because imagine the behavior of individuals consuming oil. And if oil, if equity prices double say this S&P doubles, people don't consume double the amount of oil. They'll consume double the amount of uh, 
other luxury goods, but it's very hard for people to drive two cars at the same time or two, you know, two, uh, sure. an airplane at the same time. People will consume a little bit more because maybe they'll go on a vacation or something, but even that increase is somewhat limited because you've got only so much time you can take off for vacations. So oil demand tends to be somewhat uncorrelated with uh, equity markets. Um, and uh, in relation to the second thing, if there's a, a, an economic collapse, what happens? And as I mentioned uh, you know, when we last spoke, oil demand has only fallen three times because of an economic collapse. And there was the early 1970s, it was the Arab oil embargo, the early 1980s, which was the Iran-Iraq war, and there was 2009, just that single year. So every other year, 2010, 2008, every other year, oil demand grew steadily. And so what would happen if there was a major economic collapse? Probably, I mean, oil prices would still react and be lower, but oil demand would still increase. People still, you know, it's it, oil demand grows with population growth globally, so 1%, 2% a year. Um, and so oil demand would, uh, would increase, but then uh, oil prices have already, there's the, the demand side of the equation, but it's also people kind of don't look at it as much, but there's the supply side of the equation that low prices um, are, are uh, force the oil market to become more efficient and also to stop supplying. So if the marginal cost of oil supply today is $65 a barrel, oil companies can last at $45 a barrel for a period of time, but then eventually they just shut down production and, and uh, supply gets removed from the market and prices go back up. So um, it's a pure supply and demand kind of equation, and, and if it's a pure, if there's a real economic crisis, the supply side will always just reacts to the price. The, the demand side is very, very stable, um, and even in an economic crisis, you still get demand growth. So it it kind of is somewhat uncorrelated with uh, over the long term, over say five years, three to five year period, uncorrelated with both equity markets and with economic growth cycles. In that you, you don't see um, uh, oil, oil prices don't kind of have a uh, aren't as levered to economic growth or equity markets as other assets are. It has its own kind of more stable um, underpinnings. And so um, and, and sometimes they happen at the same time you have a doubling of oil price that will happen to coincide with a doubling of equity prices or, or growth in the stock market. But usually that's coincidental, it's not causal. There's, there's um, the oil market is kind of has got its own supply and demand. There's a whole industry of people that just look at supply and demand, demand economics for oil and try and model it out and whatnot. Um, it's a really interesting space, um, but it's, it is on, it is um, tends to be uncorrelated with um, equity markets and and uh, uh, and um, economic uh, markets. And so, I mean, and one of the things is, well, are we here at forty five dollars because of a weak uh, equity market in China or because of weak economic growth in China? A little bit, but mostly it's because. OPEC's not doing its job. It's basically the supply side. If mm -hmm. OPEC is, should be keep taking a million barrels per day off the market, which they've done always, you know, on and off since the 1970s, they've said no. They want to kill the U.S. fracking industry. So even though it's it happens to be happening at the same time as weakness in the Asian equity markets and uh, and some economic growth issues there, it's mainly a supply side issue right now. That's the reason we're at forty-four dollars a barrel. Okay, really interesting. So. Morgan, I can't help but thinking now that we're almost at the end of the interview here. How are you acting in the oil market right now? Are you a? I assume that you're a buyer. It doesn't seem like you're sure. a seller. No, I, I, I'm a, a buyer. I mean, I think that uh, that uh, this is just like Warren Buffett, and I, I obviously, uh, you know, he's a very good investor. And um, I think that here is you, you basically wait for these types of opportunities to present themselves. And could oil prices go lower? Yes, but not for very long. Um, and so this is a, a time where if you've got a portfolio which is underweight oil and gas, or oil at least, you would tend to put more weight into those investments. Um, and uh, But you would have to have a horizon of 12 to, six to 18 months mm -hmm. built into your assumptions of, of a recovery. And even if there's no recovery within 12 to 18 months, there will be a recovery within because the prices here are fundamentally below the marginal cost of supply over the long term, long term being three to five years mm -hmm. or longer. Um, and so if you kind of, if you're a fundamental investor, then you, you make these kind of trades. You don't buy oil when it's, or buy an, uh, an oil and gas company when everything is fairly valued at $100 a barrel. You wait for 
uh, somewhat unusual event to happen, and then you step in and try and, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, when you had that flash crash a few, or a big crash a few days ago, you wait for things like that to happen, and then you invest. Um, and it's kind of scary because you're sitting at $44 a barrel thinking, yeah. oh my gosh, the world's going to end and whatnot. But that's the exact kind of that, having that steely nerve, those, that, those decisions make the best, best investments. So, Morgan, what is, uh, what is your long-term equilibrium estimate? And the reason why I'm asking is that you're saying the market is evaluating it to be, say, 60 or 65 if you uh, go out on the curve. But I'm also thinking that we're consuming, what is it, like 100 million barrels a day or something like that. Just under, yeah. Just under, yeah. I mean, do we have enough oil that can be produced under that margin, uh, marginal cost? I mean, that would be my thinking. Like, yeah. I would, my, I might think that the long-run equilibrium was a, is a bit higher. Do you think I'm, I'm wrong in the hypothesis? No, no I, I think the long-run long run equilibrium is also higher, higher than 100 120 dollars and then as the further out you go in time the higher that long term sure. equilibrium comes because we're burning through a non-renewable resource and we're finding new sources but they're much more expensive ultra deep offshore and whatnot um, and so and a good kind of a comparison is that if you go back to the year 2000 oil the spot oil price was 10 dollars a barrel the long term equilibrium for oil back then according to the market was eighteen dollars a barrel, mm. and you know that was say you know, fifteen years ago. And inflation hasn't accounted for the change of you know eighteen up to sixty. Um, it's come for a little bit, um, but it's basically the market kind of sets on average where it thinks it's going to be. But then you have uh, things that you know the market's predicting that there will be uh, that, that there's it'll be business as usual in the oil industry for the next ten years, in that the the supply system that's set up right now will be the same supply system in 10 years' time. It, that hasn't really been the case in the oil industry for the past 10 years. Why would that be the case in the next 10 years? And that uh, next 10 years, you may have maybe fracking becomes extremely ex uh, inexpensive, and you know these things happen. Structural change. I don't think that will happen, but maybe uh, there's a um, there's uh, some big uh, uh, natural gas. It becomes much more popular for use as a car fuel. I don't think that's going to happen because there's a whole variety of issues. But the um, the market, uh, I think, is is, a, is valued at $65 a long-term equilibrium. But uh, the market, in consensus, has been wrong in the past. Um, and I think, just personally, I think it's going to be much higher because uh, we're burning through all these incremental costs of supply, and each increment, new incremental cost of supply is there are big increases in in cost above where the prior source was. So. Above fracking, you've got offshore, and that becomes really expensive. And now all the Arctic drilling that's happening, Arctic drilling is ridiculously expensive because it's a, such a hostile environment. Even though there's no ice there for parts of the year now, there's still, during the winter, there is still a winter in the North Pole, the Arctic, <laughs> you still have freezing conditions, and you've got to put drilling equipment sitting there that can't be moved, and it's got big ice rolls hitting it. That's a very, it's you know $200 plus oil in the Arctic. And so I, I think over the long term, $65 is kind of the base case, not the, um, the, the, the medium or median case of where oil price will be. Yeah, I love that point, Morgan. You're saying long run. Well, yeah, that depends on how long term, long -term yeah. is, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, obviously, that's, uh, that's a really, really good point. Yeah. Um, Morgan, just the final questions for this interview. I've been asking you into fracking and into oil rigs and a lot more. Do you have one very important piece of information about oil that very few people know, but you think everyone should know about? One piece of information that everyone should know about. Okay, so I've got my one piece of information. So you, everyone's very aware of the price of oil because they drive down the highway in every country in the world, pretty much, and usually the price was in a big sign, and no other, uh, no other. Nothing else is kind of add, no, no one knows the price of an iPhone or an Android phone as well as they know the price of gasoline um, around, around the world because they're on those big signs. But very few people know how is who sets that price. Is it the gas station guy? Is it the government of the country that sets it, or is it some guy in OPEC that says here's the price for today? Um, and what people kind of tend not to kind of realize is that the price of oil is set on 
a market every day. There's actually a market for the NYMEX, the CME crude oil market, and there's a, uh, it's kind of the main one, there's Brent crude as well, but just for simplicity, the CME crude oil price. And the price of that gas station, even though it doesn't look like it's actually not ticking second by second, it could if the gas station would be okay with that. But the price is actually set on this futures exchange called the CME up in Chicago. It's all electronically traded these days. And so if you, people say, oh, the price of oil, where will it be in the, my gas station? If you want to know where will it be in your gas station a month from now, because of the lag between the crude oil price and the delivery mechanism of getting the oil refined and delivered to your gas station, whatnot, you can tell, uh, say, if, uh, I passed a gas station over the weekend and oil gasoline there regular was $2 a gallon exactly. Um, say oil, crude oil rallies by 10% today, from 44 to $48. Um, what would the price of, uh, will, if I drive by that gas station tomorrow, it still could be $2 a gallon. A week from now, it will probably still be $2 a gallon. But I know in 30 days' time, it's going to be 10% higher because it's already, it takes that long to filter through the supply chain to get to the, uh, the, the market. So um, basically, I, I think it's kind of a, the most interesting thing is that people don't think about is that the price of oil is set in an open market, and it's kind of an interesting how the whole process happens. Um, but it ultimately goes back to you've got WTI crude oil, um, it, you'll see it quoted on television or on our system, money.net. Um, and that kind of, there's a la after a 25 to 30 day lag, any changes in that crude oil price are pretty much exactly reflected in the change to that gas pump. Um, and so, and it's, there's nothing kind of magical or, or unusual about it. It's just a, a simple, relatively simple system. It's just somewhat obscure. People don't really mm. talk about it. Great, a great information. I think you're completely right. Everyone is looking and what's the cost of gasoline, but no one really thinks, well, how is it determined? So, uh, yeah. thank you for that information, Morgan, and thank you thank so you. much for coming on this, this interview. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone watching this have, uh, have done so too. Thanks, Dave.